Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Neve Shaw. I am the science communicator in residence for the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Project. I'm just minimizing so I can't see myself as I'm talking to you for the Climate Action Project. And um, I'm going to be talking to you tonight. I'm going to be doing a talk tonight, the very last in our series about uh, climate action, basically, and, and new approaches to climate change. Um, it's been a really interesting uh, program. We've had people talking about the psychological or the emotional effects of climate. We've had high-end um, talks from people who are engaged on, you know, in science on the ground, um, from, uh, you know, from the European Space Agency. And we have we had Duncan Stewart way back before Christmas. And then in then we also had Madeleine Murray from Change by Degrees, and then I also talk about, talked about how space kind of impacts me for the for the climate thing. So so tonight I'm going to do basically just like a review of the basics. You know, I think sometimes there's assumptions made around how our how our planet works and how climate change actually impacts that. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to telling you my take on it, if that's OK. And I'm not going to really. Um, share too many numbers it's really more just about the approach and kind of the theory behind and joining me then in the background is um the lovely Catherine Casey from uh from Leash uh, Heritage Office hi Catherine how are you Dave, how are you good to be here again and good to see you too and so you're going to be uh monitoring any comments or anything that come in on the page so I'll give time at the end for us to um have uh, you know if any questions or anything come up or any comments we'll deal with them at the end and so Perfect. yeah that's okay great okay so Catherine thanks very much for that and of course this is um an initiative of the Abbey Leaks Climate Action Project of which I am the science communicator in residence and am um, delighted to be a part of that and of course that's funded by Leash County Council, uh, Creative Leash and Midland Science. So uh, Catherine if you just go on mute I will take over from there. So I'm going to share my screen and off we go. Oh, sorry now two seconds. I'm going to share my screen. Let me put up my open my slides. Here we go. Now. There we go. Lovely. Right. Okay. So I, I'm not a, a climate scientist, but I'm a curious person. And I was curious about, I'm always curious about like climate change to me is a very overwhelming um, subject. And I struggle with kind of finding a way of, 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 of making sense of it on a daily basis. And, I, and I've had to do a lot of work to sort of um, really kind of, of understand how it impacts me on a daily basis. So uh, I always start with the human. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to try and, and give you an overview of how we connect with earth and how the climate connects us to earth and how the whole thing is kind of connected. So if you know a lot about climate and you know a lot about climate change, this may be an insult to your intelligence, but I always like, for me, I always have to understand the fundamentals in order to be able to go forward. So, so that was the theory. So I hope, you, I hope you all get something out of it. And if not, we'll talk about it afterwards. Okay, so uh, everything for me starts with this. So this is a massive, this is a photograph that has inspired me most of my life. It's a picture that was taken on Christmas Eve, 1968. Um, it was it was taken um, out of the window of one of the Apollo spacecraft, which, of course, was a series of spacecraft that were used to eventually put um, people on the moon, which the first time that happened was in 1969, happened to be two men, but um, Neil Armstrong and, and Buzz Aldrin. And uh, that picture was the first time that we saw the Earth in its entirety. And it changed people's perception of how they saw the planet. And it, it basically made people see that the planet was alive, that it had, it, that it was moving at all times and that it was, it needed to be protected. And so a lot of environmental movements and everything kicked off after seeing that picture. Now we are kind of used to seeing satellite pictures all the time. So we're a bit numb to it, but, but it starts with that. And of course that is the ultimate selfie as well because on December 24th, 1968, everybody that ever existed is in that picture. And, and people is really where 
I always start with. So, so right now I'm, I'm in Strasbourg, I'm based now in the International Space University and all of you are, are back in, in Abbey Leaks and Leash and all that. So we are occupying two different places on the planet Earth, but we're both on Earth at the same time. And I think of myself and the life I'm living now. And I think about when I was a child and uh, when my dad was younger and uh, the planet that I lived on then probably hasn't changed that much. Um, but when I was young, I had my own priorities. My dad was younger, he had his own priorities. And all of us are in that picture of, you know, of the, the, the Earthrise um, picture. And also are all of our family that came before us. So there's this, there's this thread of people um, in that picture of the earth right so so these are pictures of my family this is my great great grandfather i think this was taken at the turn of the century in 1902 as my great great grandfather on my father's side this is my grandfather and at a very young age and this is my grandmother at a very young age she's up on the top there just to the just on the very left she's holding a kind of a doll that's my granny that's my dad's father, mother these are my grandparents with my dad's parents. And um, these are my aunties and uncles when they're very young. These are my mum's parents, my grandparents. Um, they're from Leash. Uh, they grew up in Leash. And so did dad's family grow up in Leash. And this is my mum and her family when they were in the midst of it. So, so they've all lived on earth and I've lived on earth. So, you know, I know it's a kind of an assumption to say that, but you know, people are at the centre of, of all of this. And I guess it's always good to, to think about that and, and the cycle of life. We, we, are, we carry on the lineage of who we are, but it is a cycle. And so whatever age we're at or whatever um, phase we're at in life, we, we are part of the cycle. So we are born, we have a life. Some of us procreate and we die and on and on it goes. And that is the cycle of life. And since the dawn of time, we have obviously, you know, as a species been developing, but we have been constantly trying to determine who we are in the overall scheme of things. And we've looked to the night sky, we've looked for patterns in the night sky. These are the Aztecs who worship the sun. And as we go as we go back further back from our own generations to generations hundreds and thousands of years ago, we find these clues. And as we became more of an intelligent species, we started to kind of create equipment that made us look beyond. And we have always been telling the story of Earth based on us being at the center of it, that we are the most important part of the history of Earth. So before we had telescopes, we made the assumption that the sun revolved around us. And of course, once we started looking up at the night sky and people, very bright people started making calculations, it isn't that, it's that we are a planet that orbits the sun. But it's interesting that the more information we have and the more knowledge we have, the more we have to keep changing the story. And the more we have to keep adjusting our involvement in the overall scheme of things. We keep making ourselves the central character and the most important part of um, the history of, of, of our universe. But of course it's not, we are one part, a very important part, and we're connected to something much, much bigger. So right now I'm in Strasbourg and you're in Port Leash, but we're both connected because I'm talking to you now, but we're both occupying a particular amount of space on earth. If we look at the history of man in relation to the actual existence of Earth. Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And it has been around, in that time, there has always been, after about a billion years, um, there was life in the oceans and, and basically life as we know it began to kind of um, evolve, come out of the oceans. We had all different, all different types of creatures. So if you take the history of Earth and you make it a 12 hour clock, um, man or humans, let's not call it man, humans have only been around for the last 10 seconds of the 4.6 billion life cycle of uh, if that were a 12 hour clock. And yet we keep thinking 
that we're in charge, we keep thinking that all of this is for us. So sometimes it's important to step back and think of our um, contribution to uh, the planet and that it has been around a lot longer than us and we have to work together. If we look at another way, we know that our planet um, is part of a system of planets that orbits the sun. Uh, the sun we know is also about 4.6 billion years old, it's about halfway through its life cycle. We know what a day is. A day is when our planet orbits on itself, it's 24 hours. We know that we orbit the sun uh, once a year, 365 days. And the sun is a really important part of our existence. We have this, we have this privilege that we are uniquely placed in basically the right spot that makes us get the heat from the sun so that we can stay warm, but that it's not too close, that it would burn up our atmosphere or, or burn us. And we are in this perfect position that has, that has managed to keep us alive and to sustain life as we know it as humans, but as other creatures on our planet. And there is a cycle on earth the same way we have a life cycle earth has a, has a cycle as well we call it season so as the earth orbits the sun we have spring and we have summer in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere and we know this cycle and we like it we like the seasons we like spring summer autumn winter another cycle and it tells us that time is passing and time to us is determined by our lifetime. And if we go back to that 12 hour, 12, 12 hour clock, that circle of the history of the universe, the, the actual life cycle of everything is going at a completely different pace to our pace of time. And sometimes we have a tendency to think only in terms of our perception of time. And we don't see the longer patterns that are happening around us and our contribution to those longer patterns. And I think it actually contributes to the difficulty that some of us have in understanding climate change because it is such a long term issue in relation to how long we're on this planet. But as a human species, we, we, are, we are definitely involved in, in, um, in managing our climate as it is. So the sun is fantastic. The sun gives us energy. In lots of different ways it beams down on us and we have this atmosphere uh, made up of the perfect constitution of nutrients that we need in order to be able to breathe it's made up of 78 percent nitrogen and it's made up of 21 percent oxygen that's the perfect mix of, of oxygen in our atmosphere that we can breathe in. We're not really good at being able to breathe 100% oxygen but we're perfect for, for being able to breathe 20% oxygen and and the atmosphere is at a pressure that um, allows us to breathe with our lungs. The higher up you go into the atmosphere, um, are the, basically the, the molecules of air starts to thin out. And a bit like the way uh, that when the sea meets the land, it thins out until eventually you've only got like a few droplets of water from the sea and then it comes pure earth. In the same way, our molecules of air eventually kind of run out and we end up in space. And that's where our atmosphere is. And the atmosphere protects us because of the pressure of the atmosphere. So, so um, we are at one atmosphere of pressure. So that's why we hear the sound of a clap because we're surrounded by pressure all the time, which is full of this oxygen and this nitrogen. And that pressure actually prevents a lot of elements um, entering into our atmosphere and affecting us. So uh, we're protected from any falling objects, from any bits of a meteor or any bits of an asteroid, all that's pushed out and um, a lot of radiation that comes from the sun. So the sun gives us energy, but there's a lot of other radiation that comes from the sun that's just too powerful for us and our atmosphere protects us from that. And it's because of this combination of, of gases that are in the air and the pressure that they're at. And we get energy and it, it is the driving force of how all life lives on the sun or on earth. And earth, uh, like a lot of other uh, parts of our solar system is in a state of balance. And so um, 
we're positioned, like I said, just right from the sun. And that's because um, the sun has a gravitational force that pulls us towards the sun. But then two planets down, we have this planet Jupiter that's pulling us in their direction. So we have this tug of war of all these different objects that are kind of being pulled apart and being pulled together. And we happen to exist as the third planet from the sun and we're perfectly placed there. So there's a balance in terms of our place in the solar system, but there's also balance in terms of everything that's going on on Earth, this living, breathing thing. The same way that there's balance in all the things that are happening inside us right now. So we're breathing, our stomach's working, uh, our blood is pumping. And when any of that goes out of balance, we get ill and we have to go to the doctor or whatever. So everything kind of is constantly seeking this equilibrium. And when it, when, when, when it gets out of equilibrium, it'll, it'll be okay for a while, but it will adjust and adjustment comes and, and there's always a consequence to that. So we are constantly driven by equilibrium or, um, and, and earth is the same thing. So there's lots of cycles um, of, of activities that happen on earth and they're in their cycle because they are they regenerate and they renew so cycles work in the same way that we have a cycle to life cycles work so if we look at um, oxygen for instance how we get oxygen so plants gives us oxygen uh, we take in oxygen we breathe out carbon dioxide the plants take in the carbon dioxide and because of the presence of light they're able to create a kind of a chemical process which gives them energy and one of the products as a byproduct is oxygen so it's this cycle so there's been this niche where we need oxygen plants come along and they provide the oxygen for us so it's like it's perfect um, similarly, nitrogen, we're made, the, the atmosphere is made up of 78% nitrogen. Where does that come from? It comes from the living things. It comes from bacteria and the breakdown of living things. Sometimes they go into the soil and sometimes they decay and they come out. So again, that's in a cycle. So there's a nitrogen cycle. There is a carbon cycle, which I'll get into much um, in, a, in a while, into much more detail. There is a carbon cycle. So carbon is um, another element that's in uh, that's on our planet, and it's probably the, the most abundant. So all living things are made up of carbon. So when you hear people talking about organic compounds, it's always carbon containing. And carbon is one of the elements um, that's, uh, you know, that's in that's in our system and it's in it's in wood, it's in us, it's in our cat, it's in our dog, it's in rocks, it's in, um, in any, any kind of organism, there is carbon in it. And it's important that carbon is there. And it has a cycle in the same way. It moves around our planet and it moves around in, in quite a complex way. And we need it. Carbon is the fuel that keeps us all alive and it's the building blocks for life. But I'll go into more about the carbon cycle in a second. And then there's the water cycle. There's a cycle to water. We have um, we have a lot of water on our planet. Uh, the majority of it is tied up in our oceans, which has um, a, a, an element of, of salt in it. And the salt has come from the land. So as water drives down, um, drives down hills, it ends up in the oceans. And uh, as the water evaporates, it goes up into the into the air and it becomes clouds and then they get too heavy and then they condense and then that rains and then that runs off again and so you get this build up of of salt in the sea because the um some of the elements uh, or some of the soil the nutrients that are in the soil remain in the sea and uh, where the water purifies and goes back up it leaves those elements behind and those nutrients behind and that's what makes salt water and it creates this bed of nutrients as well at the bottom of our oceans and a lot of the fresh water is tied up in our polar ice caps in the North and South Pole. So only a tiny amount is rivers and streams is fresh water. And yet it keeps us alive. It's, it's the lowest percentage of water available for humans. And yet there's more than enough to go around. So that's the water cycle. And, and Earth is abundant um, uh, for water. It's known as the pale blue dot because from a distance it's blue and that blue hue is what gives Earth its unique uh, characteristics and, um, and that's because of our position in the in the solar system that allows us to have all this water. Mars was a planet once that had lots of flowing water and, and something happened to its planet that, that that broke down. We don't want that to happen on Earth. And talking about the cycle life and the history of people, when I look back at my grandparents, my great grandparents and great great grandparents, they existed in an era when I think we were more in tune with cycles and the cycle of life and seasons. 
We may not have had the technology, we may not have had the comforts that we have in life, but I think we were more connected to nature. The more outside we are, the more we're connected with nature. And it's interesting during lockdown, her people are saying that without the commute and everything every day to work, that they're more aware of their environment and the birds and the sounds, because that connection to nature is important for us to understand um, and to read the cycles of the land and also of ourselves. So we farmed a lot, but we worked with the land. And um, around about, you know, the 1800s or so, we started to get very smart and we started to mass produce things. And uh, we had a number of what's known as industrial revolution. So we were able to mass produce things. So, you know, we had Gutenberg who came up with the with the printing press to produce books and with people who who started to make cotton um you know from flaxseed and 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 um we became better at creating machines to mass produce things because it would save time and so we were able to kind of get product out more and so people were starting to make money because they were able to make things in a concentrated amount of time using a piece of equipment and getting money coming out but in order to do that we started to kind of have to find a way of powering these machines. And also we, we wanted to kind of move from A to B faster. So we came up with um, machines to take us from A to B, new transportation systems. And we uh, came up with the combustion engine and different things. And we started to burn um, fuel in order to make these engines go faster in order for us to have this new kind of lifestyle. And we have been doing that consistently since these different industrial revolutions. So there's been, they reckon there's kind of been four industrial revolutions. So one was like when steam power came along and the, and the looms, you know, with the flax seeds and stuff. And then in the late 1800s, then mass production came along and the assembly line, electrical energy uh, came along. And then, you know, in the 70s, we started, in, we, you know, plastic was the new, uh, the new thing that you'd never need to, to uh, buy a cup again. You'd only have one cup for the rest of your life or one place. This was the idea. And we got into semiconductors and electronics. And now we're in the fourth, which is all about the computer era and uh, Internet of Things and, and artificial intelligence. And it's great. I love technology. Look, at, I'm an engineer and a scientist. and I love it. But there is a cost to that. And that intensive amount of um, industrialization has meant that we've had to industrialize the way we live and the way we power these plants and so we have been thirsty for power we haven't been using the power of the sun we've used our own way of creating that power and a lot of it has been about burning uh, coal petrol and other fuel system in order to keep these machines running and to give us this power we've also started to in intensively making things we've forgotten about the cycle you know the cycle that earth has that we have that water has that nitrogen has that oxygen has that plants has we've kind of just gone to the first half created all this stuff but we haven't finished the second half so there's this big pile up of stuff that's happening all the time and there's no way of getting rid of it. So nature and the planet has been dealing with it. It's fine. Not too badly in the 1800s and in the 1900s. But eventually something starts to give. This is where we're at now. And what started to give was firstly was that um, the more fuel you build, the more fuel you, you burn, the more carbon dioxide goes up into our sky. And we have an atmosphere and we have this delicate relationship between us and the sun and our atmosphere and we take, can take heat from the sun and we can also give heat off and uh, we have this ability to withhold the uh, heat of the sun because of our atmosphere based on the composition of gases that are in the air and carbon dioxide is really good at insulating us as is methane and as is other chemicals uh, in the sky in our sky but if there's too many of them 
there's nowhere we get like in a greenhouse it just gets too hot and so there's nowhere for it to go and that's kind of what's been happening with us burning all these fossil fuels so if you look at this um if you look at this graph of temperature so it's been taken back to the 1850s so this is the the, the average temperature of the globe or of earth and uh it has shifted by uh it's gone up by by one degree in the last kind of you know consistently over the last kind of 100 years and now the temperature the core temperature of the planet is gone up by one degree and if that continues we're going to kick off new cycles of things that won't necessarily be amenable to us as a species and that's why we talk about climate change now i hear a lot of times people talking about but the planet's in a cycle and it's just the cycle and you know we've seen a cycle of temperatures rising and then there's the ice age and everything so so i agree that that's true um but in the polar regions um ice is a great way for us to determine the history of our planet and and also the the composition of our atmosphere and uh, samples were taken of uh, the North and the South Pole, these core samples were taken. And a bit like the rings of a tree, the way they can determine the age of a tree, um, you can take, uh, the, the ice builds up every year in these cores, these ice cores. So you're actually able to read line by line what happens over a long period of time. So this is data from one of those cores that shows us 800,000 800, years of change in our carbon dioxide concentration. And you can see that um, it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and goes down in this, in this graph. And there to show you the different ice ages. But if you look at the last part of that graph that's blown up, where we've gone, um, we've, we, we've been looking at it basically for just the last uh, 1,000 years. And if you go from 1950 to 1975 and then all the way up to 2015, that is not because the planet is uh, is in a, a cycle of the ice age, the cycle of temperatures going up, ice age, temperatures going up, ice age. No, no, this is like a massive spike. And the reason for that is, is because of what we've done to the planet. It's our fault. You can't blame that on nature. And this is what's called climate change or um, a global warming. We, we um, And so, our planet right now is basically bunged up and it's got too much carbon dioxide uh, hanging around in our atmosphere. And the consequence of that is, is that the greenhouse effect that normally works really well in balance with us to keep us warm, uh, carbon dioxide and methane are fantastic um, gases to insulate us and to keep us warm when there's enough concentration, but when there's too much this, the rays of the sun come into our planet, they get captured in our atmosphere, but they're not getting out enough. And so it's having this effect of heating up our planet already by a degree. And if it gets any, if it goes any further, we are, um, the scientists have told us that that will be critical to us. So the way I see that in my head is that we've been burning all this fuel, but we haven't been thinking about the cycle. And um, I'll, I'll go through the, the carbon cycle with you in a second and explain why. So the way I see it in my head is imagine if we threw out nothing in our house. That's the way I see carbon in our atmosphere. There's nowhere for it to go. I see it like this as well. If we could actually see it, we probably wouldn't. We probably would have done something about it, but because we can't see it, because it has, because it's it's happening over such a long time frame in relation to the way we see time, we're not really getting, you know, we, we can't really see how this has happened because over the, the, the way we measure time, we, we can't really see how this could possibly happen, but it's, it's an accumulative effect. And it's because we've kind of not kept to this equilibrium thing that our planet, our solar system, us, uh, plants, animals, everybody naturally has. We've pushed things too far. So now what are we going to do? So let's talk about the, the carbon cycle first. So we will always, um, there's we, there's always like um, this cycle of carbon happening and it's always being released into the atmosphere. It's just that we've taken too much of it. 
And the reason for that is, is there's two kind of types of, of what they call kind of carbon. There's fast carbon and then there's kind of the, the slower long term carbon. So fast carbon um, is relates to uh, the carbon cycle in relation to when we breathe out, you know, we breathe out carbon dioxide and the plants will take that in and then they'll breathe out some oxygen. And they also have, a, they respire a little bit of carbon dioxide as well. And we burn fires as a little bit of carbon dioxide given off. All that is very manageable. But long term, uh, carbon has been stored in the bottom of our oceans and also in our soil for long periods of time. And there are pockets um, of carbon that have been preserved in such a way, the way it's happened that they've been pressurized and everything, that they have these veins of like what we have found to be gas and coal and, and oil, and they're very efficient. They're very efficient to burn. They've got very high concentrations of carbon, but they're part of the slow carbon. And they're more difficult for us to remove from our atmosphere. And we have to find ways to um, get rid of them in, in smarter ways rather than just relying in the natural carbon cycle because they are in addition to what we would normally have uh, on a regular basis about the, the loop of carbon, which is usually kind of the, the fast carbon. So we're in a kind of a predicament where we have to get rid of this excessive carbon and we have to think of ways of doing it. And the, the three kind of biggest uh, sinners of carbon, the three kind of sources where it's come from has been transport, the way that we use our cars, energy, the way we've been kind of looking for energy to power things and to keep us warm, and, um, and agriculture. Agriculture is less of, of, a, of a problem really because it can, it can change quite rapidly, but transport and, and energy are the big ones. And the mass production factories and industrialization are the big offenders. And I know people are kind of going, well, that's, you know, I can't do that. I have nothing. I can't help with that. I'm only a person. Like, there's only so much that I can do. But it's, you can do something if you know about it. And if you accept it and you become aware of it and you start to change your life practices, because then that's how we can then engage our local community, our local government, and it becomes policy and it becomes unacceptable behavior, and then something has to change. Because these are all the different forms of carbon that we have. And as I say, some of them are, are healthy and some of them are not healthy. And what's happened is because of this excessive use of carbon for us to get energy and for transport, we have a situation now where it's not just about carbon. Earth is reacting to it. And so what's happening is that as the atmosphere uh, starts to warm up, uh, that has an effect on our, uh, on our polar ice caps. We have more water melting. It also affects uh, the atmosphere itself. And you're starting to get freakish weather. You're getting more kind of bushfires and then you're getting more floods. And that's just nature's way of trying to um, balance itself back out again. And so we're seeing these happening. We're seeing um, uh, erosion of beaches. We're seeing a, a change in, in different species. Like you talk to anybody in their specialization, you know, we had Ricky Whelan talking about uh, birds and he's saying that, you know, we're losing different species or species are changing their behaviors because the temperatures are different. They're getting confused. We're getting a rise in sea levels because um, of the, you know, of the melting of the ice caps. So, so everything, is changing because nature and the earth is driven by balance so if you're getting a big rise in carbon you're getting this rise in temperature it's going to try and account for that and alleviate for it and these are the consequences it's not really good so so ireland's contribution to that are if we break down what's happening in ireland this is where our greenhouse gases are coming from. This is from the European, uh, the, the um, EPA document, which is really good if you want to take a look at it. It's a good read as well. So this is what's broken down for us. So 22% of our offending use of carbon is um, for energy and then transport, industry, and 32% for agriculture. Uh, homes are 10% and waste is 2%. And this is the breakdown of where we're getting our energy from. And you see that most of it is oil and oil products. 
and natural gas are the two big ones and some coal. So we have a long, long way to go. But it's not bad. It's not all that bad because, you know, for the last 10 years or so, we have been actively trying to change that. And there is more and more use of renewable energy. So renewable energy refers to energy that doesn't originate from um from these fossil fuels, that it's energy that's being created that is renewable. And then clean energy is that there is no, uh, there is absolutely no, nothing burned in order to create that power. So uh, solar panels are clean energy and it's renewable energy. Wind energy is renewable energy and it's, and it's clean energy. And uh, the, and hydropower as well, using water. And these are alternatives. And 10, 15 years ago, the actual efficiency of thinking about Ireland using solar power was ridiculous. We just didn't have the, you know, we didn't have the power in the sun. Uh, that's That was the problem. But it is now, we can do it now. And it's getting cheaper in order to implement that. So, so there is a future for us to do that. And also, I see in the news that we are forcing countries like China, which is which is one of the big offenders in terms of its industrialization and and throwing out a lot of, of carbon dioxide emissions, that it is crawling slowly towards carbon neutrality, like at least they're actually fessing up and they're doing something about it. So that's good. Um, we see the same things in the United States. We've had the Paris Agreement where, where collectively uh, different countries have got together and they said, yes, we are going to do something about this and we are going to stop the continual increase of our global temperature, which will hopefully reverse the way the earth is already starting to adapt and we can bring it back to a state of balance. And only yesterday we had our own country announce a new climate bill, which is committing to a net zero carbon by 2050. A net zero is where whatever carbon um, is emitted and um, there will be th this cycle in place where they will remove it so that we won't be contributing an excess of carbon to the atmosphere over a period of time. And I guess it's important to think about when you think of this is that you have to think of the whole planet um, and not just what we're doing on our own because we can't do this on our own. No one country, no one town, no one person can do this on our own. We have to start to think more globally. And I do think actually that being in lockdown that's helped us because we've had to communicate on Zoom and everything and the whole world is involved in this pandemic. And I think that that awareness that the whole world is sharing something together. If we could apply that same kind of mindset to something like climate change, maybe we can start to think together because what happens on one end of the planet affects the other end of the planet as well because of air streams um if there's a fire on one side of the world the smoke will billow all the way across and it'll impact countries long enough behind so it's about thinking about using energy differently renewable energy and we're already doing it we've got wind farms we are using solar power we are using we are thinking about using um our own uh short-term carbon um, opportunities for creating energy and keeping away from the fossil fuels, the things that like coal and oil and, and natural gas. And if we all commit to that long-term, we will be able to get back to a more balanced um, world. And in terms of Abbey Leaks, I've just been blown away by the awareness of the region about uh, climate action and climate awareness and every citizen doing their part if you if you saw almanac tv it's incredible talking to different locals doing different things they're extremely aware of their own carbon footprint carbon footprint being their own contribution to the buildup of, of carbon dioxide in our air in our atmosphere and um, and if you haven't watched an uh, almanac I, I would advise you to go back and, and check out the abbey leaks facebook page because people are doing incredible things in your region you even have the community gardens and even this climate action plan. People, very smart people talking about biodiversity, your bog project, um, taking back the bog. Uh, Pete, of course, um, you know, being a big offender of, of carbon emissions, but by rewetting the bogs, it's becoming a sink again and it's holding in carbon. So fantastic initiatives and, and the beauty of your region and nature is crying out for us to just work in in union with it. And I really do believe that Abbey Leaks and the region has, like even 
one of the people that we spoke to as part of Fast Facts for Science Week, we were talking to the people involved in Port, Port Leash to become a low carbon town. We can learn a lot from each other in, in doing this. So we are, I'm here in Strasbourg and you're in, in Leash right now. And sometimes we have a tendency to just think about ourselves locally, but, but we can't really because we're part of a cycle and we're part of this, we're part of planet Earth. And um, we have a responsibility to stay in our cycle and respect the cycle of everything around us, to think about the future for our children and not to think of the timeline in terms of our daily lives, but the timeline in terms of how our planet works. So to think of a 20 year, a 50 year plan so that we were given a quite a healthy planet uh, by our forefathers, by my great grandparents. They they did it naturally. And so we have a responsibility for us to pass on a healthier planet to our future generations. And I'm going to finish now with another little bit of space, because um, what I like about the universe when, when I study space is that it reminds me of that massive timeline of which we're a part and that we're we. Um, we're here for such a short period of time, but in the history of our species, we've done so much. So Carl Sagan is a, is a big inspiration of mine. And there was a mission that headed out into space in the late 1970s. And when it got, it, it's now, it's still in interstellar space. And, and it was the first time we had pictures taken of Saturn and Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune. And when it got to Saturn, it was 1990, on St. Valentine's Day, he asked the um, scientists to turn the camera around off on the Voyager mission and to look back at Earth. And um, and this was the picture that was taken and the, the arrow is pointing to where we are at that time. And he's so he, he's a, he was a philosopher as well as a, a really smart scientist. And this is what he said. And this was his reaction and, and his response to that image. Sorry, I'll start it again. I just realized that I had my headphones on so you can't hear it. Now, there you go. this distant vantage point, the Earth <laughs> might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, Every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings how eager they are to kill one another, how fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity in all 
this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit? Yes. Settle? Not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So I think that's really the essence of, of, of everything I've been trying to say, you know. So I will leave it there. And I hope that I helped break down that massive topic of the climate and how we're contributing to it and how we can, we can do more to help. Okay, all right, I'll stop there. And I will uh, check in with you, Catherine, and see if there has been any uh, any queries or anything coming in on the comments section yeah we've had a couple of interesting questions actually i might just start working through them i suppose um you mentioned one of them and maybe we'll start with this one because you kind of touched on it there a minute ago when you said that lock I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I've lost you or if it's my internet or if it's yours, Catherine, but I can't, I can't see you there. I'm going to check the, I'm going to check the Facebook page myself in case I can get them. Let me see. A massive topic of check the, I'm going to check the Facebook page myself in case um let's see Catherine are you there there you are you're there Catherine you're back yeah can you hear me no I don't think I can um Catherine are you there Oh, I'm getting a chat, I think, from Catherine. Catherine, can you hear me now? Catherine, are you there? I can hear, can you hear me? <laughs> These are the realities of life. This is the world we live in now. Can you hear me, Catherine? Can you, got, have you got me? Can you hear me? No, it's mad, isn't it? Can you put in the chat maybe, Catherine? Because I, I can't, I can't. Can you hear me? No, we're both looking at I each other. Can you hear me now? Can, yes, I wonder what. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. I don't know, my, I think I somebody started a Zoom call downstairs and I, my connection went, I'm really sorry. It's okay, it's fine. It's fine, I was thinking it was me. I was like, oh my God, is it me, is it me? But uh, I tried no. to never check the comments when I'm online. It's so weird because I see myself and I get completely thrown by it. <laughs> Okay. Did you hear the question or was no, I gone completely? Some, no. Jackie was asking about um, something you touched upon, which was yeah. the, has the pandemic changed our, our impressions of climate change? Has it made it feel a bit more, a bit less abstract? Something we can all work on together. Oh, yeah. And I suppose related to that, then maybe some practical things that people might be able to do um, in your suggestions to, to yeah. what they can still do about climate change. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think like the people that I've met over the last few months through the climate action project, my gosh, they have some fantastic tips. You know, if you, if you go back through the fast facts section um, of the different people that we interviewed, they, they're just really simple things. Like they just think, just have it like, where does your energy come from? Right. So if you have any control over that, uh, control it, 
find a cleaner version of of your energy so where does your heat come in um you know like if if it's electricity um you know your local supplier are they using uh renewable energy to provide your electricity or are they or you know where does that you know where does that originate from um what car are you driving you know uh could it be a hybrid uh, do you have to drive could you cycle um, where are you getting your clothes from? You know, because fashion is a big thing now. And, you know, it's a big absorber. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big industry. And so fast fashion is becoming uh, one of the offenders now um, around kind of climate change and, and lots of other things in terms of pollution. So where does your fashion come from? Um, simple things uh, like that. When you go to the uh, when you go to the store, or is it are they is it local produce? Has it traveled far? Um, and, and I also think just reading, uh, you know, like I, I hope that some of the things I've gone through are, the, are like the building blocks and the basics so that the next time you pick up a newspaper, you might be in a position to kind of better understand what, what it's about. And it's, it's not even about the numbers or anything. It's just about the, the scale of it and trying to break it down to achievable chunks. The other thing I think is really important is, is to is to kind of keep talking about it to each other and also uh, to influence your local governments and your councillors. And um, it's it's really about policy at the end of the day. That's what makes things happen. So using your using your feet to 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 show what you're prepared to put up with and what you're not prepared to put up with. So because if enough people complain, something will happen. And we're kind of seeing that now, but it just the more we can do that, the better. That's what's really going to change long term, you know. That's definitely true. And a lot of people feel a bit overwhelmed because they think even the small things that I can do really, are they going to make a difference? So it is important to say to people, the things that you do, not only will they make a difference, but they'll give an example to others. And also then if it will make you um, educated to talk to the decision makers, talk to the people who make the decisions and make you feel like, well, I've done this. What are you going to do? Yeah. We had a, a really interesting discussion earlier in the series with Sally Weintraub. She was talking about the overwhelm that people feel um, and how people sometimes uh, try and run away from that and how it's important to just let yourself feel overwhelmed because it is overwhelming it's a terrible it's a it's an onerous task that we're facing and maybe if we at least acknowledge that maybe we can start to make take action I think that's a paraphrasing what she said much more eloquently but yeah. um it really rang true with me yeah it's true but also like we can change I mean if you if you look at like say if somebody had said to you 30 years ago that you know there'd be no smoking in buildings nobody would have believed you and yet the no smoking ban came in and we did it if somebody had said that you weren't going to get plastic bags you know when you went shopping nobody would have believed it and yet we did it and and so i think it's just about an adjustment shift and if you're if if your awareness is always uh, ever present about your personal contribution um, and your understanding of where your energy is coming from and, and your transportation systems, that naturally starts to inform the people around you, like what you're saying, Catherine, but also you just won't accept anything less than that. So it's something has to change. And, you, and exactly what you're saying, it just becomes a new way of life and that's it. And you're not taking anything second to that, you know, so that's, um, that's important. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. they're really they're really good points that you make really good examples because they're examples of things where people might have been taking individual action but nothing changed until there was system change yeah. i think that's what we really need to see now and people need to th one of the things i would say to people they need to do as you said is speak to politicians tell them that it matters to you our young people are doing that all of the time but yeah. maybe the next generation have something to learn about um making sure that politicians when when we talk to them know who cares about this they know the the lobbies that are lobbying on the other side for sure so they need to hear from the people who really care about it yeah. um, on our side as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, some, something somebody said to me last night in a comment actually on, on when I was just promoting the, the talk that we're having tonight, I almost always get a, a comment from somebody saying, oh, there's been no there's been no climate change. It's just part of a natural cycle. And you mentioned it earlier in your talk. And one of the things I struggle with is the temptation to, to sort of hit these people with science and say, no, with evidence of this and evidence of that, I don't think that's going to change their minds. Do you have any thoughts on how we can engage people like that who are just really sceptical? And I don't think banging them over the head with the facts is going to help. No, but I, I think the cycle thing, for me, it's about the cycle. You know, like I, I really think, like all you have to do is see anything that has come from nature is cyclical. And so you look at industry and, and there's never any consequences of how to finish 
what they started. Do you know what I mean? Like, so everything else has a beginning, middle and end, beginning, middle and end. And, and so, you know, it's like if you didn't tidy your room, you'd be left with a room full of mess. So I, I see it in the same way as that. And so, so that's when I tell people who go like, you know, that there is, you know, that I don't see any difference, but, but like logically, if you think about it, if you're, if you're burning all this fuel and all this smoke is going up in the air, where, where do you think it's going? And, and how are we going to mop that up? So, so think of it as a cycle. So if you don't mop it up, it's going to, it's going to keep building up just like a dirty room or, 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 you know, anything that doesn't get addressed the pile. Uh, you know, it's like I was saying to you before we started, you get these influx of emails, but if you don't answer your emails, they just keep piling up. So it's this, it's this idea of, if you if you borrow something, you have to return it. Um, you know, it's respectful behavior. It's it's what we do naturally as humans. So it the same thing applies to the way we get our energy. So you burn something um, that gets converted into carbon dioxide and and heat and and water vapor. But that carbon dioxide has to go somewhere. Where does it go? So if we can't think of a way of getting rid of it, then we can't burn. And you have to think of it that way. You know, you have to take responsibility for everything that you do. Finish it. If you're going to start something, finish it. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah, we've just got a lovely comment here from Ashling who says, her just turned six-year-old is a massive fan of yours, Neve, and they've yeah. stayed up late for these talks and filled a notebook full of her notes. So it's amazing to see this, the talks back through a young person's eyes. It's certainly never too young to start, and we're delighted to see that. Thanks thanks so much, Ashling. Thanks, but it's Ashling. true that a lot of the time, the, the commitment and the enthusiasm of young people can be inspirational to all of us. Sometimes they see things with a black and white um, vision that helps us to see it actually, sometimes it actually is that simple. We get used to compromise as we're older, but sometimes it actually is that simple. We just have to change and that's it. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think they understand the responsibility because you see, we're telling it to them all the time. We're telling them if you, you know, put your toys away, flush the toilet, you know, but, but we don't do it when we apply it to like industry or some of our work practices, you know, there's there's always consequences. I think children really understand that. And I think children really care about the planet and they care about nature. And I think sometimes economically we can forget that for profit. Yeah, for sure. We get distracted, but I think we've all come back to what's important in the end. Yeah. And if I'd like to just finish up by thanking you so much for all of the work that you put into this series. This is our last official talk of, of this series but it's been an absolute pleasure working with you i know the people in Abeliques have got a huge amount out of it as well and all the people who've watched the talks from all over the country and outside the country have too so a really sincere thanks to you for curating this this series for us we're really looking forward to what happens to you what we see from you next we know you've recently moved to strasbourg so we're expecting big things from you yeah. um, and just very much thanks very much for for all of the time and the work that you've put into it all of the talks are still available on the facebook live here so if anybody wants to look back um, and I'm sure if anybody has any questions that they'd like to pass on, we can try and get you to cover them um, in the coming time. Absolutely. Um, so we wrap it up there. And uh, yeah. do you want to just say a final few words? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Like, I hope uh, what I found was when I went back through the series, I, I guess sometimes when um, I, I, I kind of just wanted to go through the building blocks of, of where, you know, where this carbon dioxide emission kind of comes from. And I hope that I kind of filled in the blanks. And so maybe you can go back and revisit Anna Maria Trofer's talk from um, the climate office. It might actually make more sense now if you go back into that. And also the one from Duncan Stewart further back, you know, so it's just like if you if you think about the context and you can kind of make make that feel more um you that if you can break that down then maybe it might help you see your own personal way through um on, on climate change and, and how it kind of will impact you but thanks very much and uh we uh it's been a it's been a privilege putting it together and having these conversations so um i'll stop streaming now so good night everybody and thanks again and just to remind you that the climate action project where i am science communication uh in residence uh wouldn't be possible without the support of leash county council uh, midland science and uh, creative leash so Good night, everybody.